It's a much repeated boast about Jeremy Corbyn that he's an anti-racist campaigner of impeccable pedigree. Just look at this picture of him protesting apartheid in the 1980s. He's the embodiment of nobility. Well, sure, if you want a bumper sticker version of politics. But if we delve deeper, this picture really is worth a thousand words. This story takes place in the summer of 1984. South African President P.W. Botha was on a European tour. He was attempting to improve international relations for his country, which was then under white supremacist rule. He visited West Germany, Portugal, Switzerland, Belgium, France, Austria, Italy and the Vatican. And finally, Great Britain. The centrepiece of the UK visit would be a meeting at the Prime Minister's official residence in Chequers. The British knew this was a risky occasion, with South Africa almost without friends at the time. And on the day of the Chequers meeting, 50,000 people attended an anti-apartheid rally in London's Hyde Park. Wary of giving the visitors respectability without anything concrete in return, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher held a tough line with her guests. She took both her to task over apartheid. We felt strongly that people's rights should not be determined by the colour of their skin, minutes of the meeting recorded. Thatcher demanded that forcible removal of urban blacks had to stop and that apartheid had to be dismantled, Mandela and other prisoners released. She was more conciliatory regarding the ongoing fighting in Namibia, but was still firm. South African Foreign Minister Pikbotha insisted on the withdrawal of Cuban troops from the region. This alien presence in its immediate vicinity was not to be tolerated. If necessary, South Africa, which is a region of power, would go to war. We appreciate the great strategic importance of South Africa, and nor do we wish communism to spread in Africa or elsewhere, but it would be much better if war was avoided. Namibia might cost South Africa a lot now, but such a war would cost a lot more. With his demands on the ANC headquarters in London, Perhaps Botha thought he could win over the fiercely anti-communist Prime Minister. The South Africans were convinced the ANC London office was a nerve centre of terrorist activities and asked that the office be closed. Thatcher was having none of it. She replied, we could not do this under our law and there was no evidence that the office personnel had been guilty of illegal activities. Its main function remains what it has always been publicity and propaganda. Trevor Huddleston, chairman of the anti-apartheid movement, was deeply impressed, writing a letter to 10 Downing Street. I need hardly say how much your public statement on television after the fateful meeting with Mr. Botha has done to give me encouragement and hope. Her demands to Botha were truly all I could have wished for. In addition, secretary of the British anti-apartheid movement, Abdul Minty, met the Prime Minister and got her government to recommit itself to both the South African arms embargo and the Glen Eagles Agreement. A tough diplomatic hand to play, but overall a good deal of progress for both the British government and the anti-apartheid movement. So, back to the photograph. What was Corbyn doing at this time? While the achievements were welcomed by the overwhelming majority of those fighting apartheid, one small faction was not satisfied the City of London branch of the anti-apartheid movement. This branch was dominated by two factions, the Revolutionary Communist Group and the Workers' Revolutionary Party, both of whom had long agitated for a non-stop picket outside the South African embassy in Trafalgar Square. The wider anti-apartheid movement knew this would be counterproductive, but despite cajoling and even legal action, the protests went ahead. In 1984, the Workers' Revolutionary Party was led by Jerry Healy, a serial rapist, while the Revolutionary Communist Group considered the ANC too soft and extended solidarity to the Pan-Africanist Congress, whose unofficial song was One Settler, One Bullet. This was the protest Jeremy Corbyn chose to be at, and this was the location of his arrest. We should not really be surprised by any of this. It's a theme that dominates his history. In almost every situation, when faced with a choice of factions, Jeremy Corbyn will actively seek out the most repulsive 
and side with them. He chose Hamas in Palestine, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the IRA in Northern Ireland, M19 in Colombia, Chavez in Venezuela, Milosevic in Kosovo. This behavior depressingly goes on and on ad nauseum. Just this year, he broke bread with Die Linke in Germany. So yes, at first blush, this does appear to be a noble protest by a principled man, but scratch the surface and the stench becomes unbearable. Far from garnering respect for him, these actions should be met with abject contempt. If you enjoyed this story, why not subscribe to the channel? Upcoming episodes cover China's Belt and Road Initiative, Charter Cities, and, if I can muster the energy, whether Corbyn really deserves to be called a decent man.